to this edition of the webinar hosted by the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. This webinar is hosted in collaboration with the Howard T. H. Chan School of Public Health's India Research Center. Howard India Center is the first global center for the Howard School of Public Health. Physically based out of Mumbai, the center works in India to promote public health research, training, and translation. The topic for today's webinar is the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak on the health and well-being of children. To set the context, when the WHO declared COVID-19 as a public health emergency in January of 2020, many of us would not know that they parallelly also released a briefing to emphasize on the need for nations to provide mental health and psychosocial services to their populations during the pandemic. The briefing anticipated a rise in stress and anxiety levels of people as nations across the world implemented varying degrees of physical distancing measures. Since the lockdown was declared in India, as we all know, children have been staying indoors. They're out of schools. For most of them, education has gone online and they've been far removed from outdoor group activities and team sports. Parents themselves are adjusting to a new lifestyle. Many are working from home, but some have even lost their jobs or daily wages. This has particularly impacted the families of migrant workers when we talk about the Indian context. Parenting in such a situation can become very challenging as parents have to attend to their own economic and psychosocial needs and at the same time support the health and well-being of their children. With that context, we would like to welcome and introduce the eminent speakers for our panel today. We will begin by welcoming Dr. Kariston Koenen, Professor of Psychiatric Epidemiology at the Department of Epidemiology and Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health, Harvard University. Dr. Koenen's research focus is threefold. First, she studies why some people develop PTSD, also known as the post-traumatic stress disorder and related mental health problems, while other people are resilient when exposed to similar traumatic events. Second, she investigates how violence and trauma can affect long-term mental and physical health. Third, she aims to expand access to evidence-based mental health treatment for survivors of violence and trauma. Thank you, ma'am. Then we would like to introduce Dr. Archana Basu, clinical psychologist and instructor at the Mass General Hospital, part of the Harvard Medical School Group, and a research associate at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Basu conducts research on the impact of traumatic events and severe stressors on mental and physical health outcomes. She works with families coping with severe or traumatic stressors and terminal medical conditions. And we are happy to welcome Dr. Shekhar Shishadri, Senior Professor at the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the Associate Dean of Behavioral Sciences at NIMHANS, which is the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences a nodal agency working under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Dr. Shashadri has worked extensively in the areas of child and adolescent mental health. He's also actively involved in other areas of work. These include gender and sexualities, trauma and abuse, juvenile justice, and children living in difficult circumstances. And finally, I'm Dr. Ananya Avasti, your moderator for today's session. I work in the capacity of an assistant director to the Harvard India Research Center, and I also serve on the advisory committee of the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. With that uh, brief setting of the context, can I pose my first uh, question to you, Dr. Koenen? Your research for the past 20 years has focused on studying traumatic events. In your experience, how different is the current corona crisis from the disasters and health emergencies that we have experienced previously? Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here with Dr. Shishadri and Basu. And um, as I would like the audience to know, like I was telling you before, I have never had the opportunity to visit India, but I'm hoping this will get me an invitation to come as soon as possible when this is all, when we're past this. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has a lot of characteristics that other disasters I've worked in have, um, including the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York City. Um, it's been, um, we, when we think of trauma, we think of something that's unpredictable and uncontrollable. And um, it certainly feels that way to most people that you know we couldn't have predicted this and that a lot of things feel out of our control. Um, 
you know, every day it's sort of, um, you know, unable to work, our kids aren't in school, when will we be back in work? When will our kids be back in school? When will things open? You know, can we get food in the shops? Um, and in trauma, what we think about is, you know, when trauma occurs, when these things overwhelm our ability to cope. So I think this has a lot of characteristics of other disasters where um, people have felt out of control and like they couldn't predict things. What's different about this is I think the the length of time it's been going on in that um, usually disasters are more acute. There's a sort of hurricane and the immediate aftermath or the attack and the immediate aftermath and then cleaning up that. Um, and we think more like weeks, et cetera. And now we're into months um, in Boston, you know, we're into months. Um, and we really don't know how long these lockdowns will last. Um, and then on top of it, there's all the other aspects. There's the economic fallout, there's bereavement, there's stigma um, occurring against certain groups. So I would say it's it has a lot of similarities, but it's different in that it's so pervasive and has in, impacted so many aspects of our lives. Um, and we're talking about kids in terms of our kids' lives. Having kids out of school for months at a time or unable to play outside, that's different than really any other situation I've been in. Right. Talking about kids and communication, since we have a lot of time to do so, uh, my next question is to Dr. Basu. With the rapid spread of the coronavirus, managing family communications, as Dr. Karisin mentioned, and supporting children in a time of uncertainty is probably the single biggest challenge mm -hmm. that parents are currently facing. Can you share some tips on how do you really talk to your child about you know, what is coronavirus, what is COVID-19? And are there any strategies to tailor your communication to children of different ages? Um, yeah, um, so also thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, the question that um, you brought up is actually one of the first and co most common questions that parents sort of ask and wonder about, you know, how do I talk to my child? What words do I use um, to explain the changes that they're experiencing? Um, and overall, uh, research supports the idea that age-appropriate open communication can help children to make sense of what they're already experiencing and observing. So sometimes we wonder whether it's best not to say anything. Uh, we wonder whether, you know, kids, what kids are noticing might be uh, quite limited. Um, but in fact, kids are very observant. Um, what they might observe or how they're experiencing this pandemic can vary a lot based on um, age. So for example, with older children, um, teenagers, and those who are getting closer to applying for college, um, colleges, they might be much more concerned about the potential impact on you know, schooling and grades and kind of maintaining um, that routine. Um, for younger kids, um, you know, kindergarten and older, um, you know, they might be much more concerned about not being able to play with their friends, not being able to see their grandparents. Um, so the way in which kids experience it um, can feel and look very different to based on their ages. Um, so helping children sort of um, understand their experiences um, through age appropriate communication is sort of in an overarching way, one of the uh, recommendations. Um, and it is frankly in those conversations that, uh, you know, with parents or grandparents that kids generally make sense of their worries, um, come up with questions um, and trust that they can, you know, talk it through with someone and feel supported. Um, so parents can certainly begin by asking kids what changes they might have noticed and um, see whether they bring up schooling concerns or you know, who they are missing um, and then you know, plan with them about uh, ways in which they can address those specific worries. Um, also, one of the you know, tremendous advantages of this type of open communication, which is of course healthy in many regards, but particularly in the context of the pandemic, one issue that comes up, especially with teens, is that they have access to a lot of online information, um, WhatsApp forward, social media, um, and there is potential for confusion and mis you know, misinformation. Um, so this type of open family communication also allows parents to clarify any confusions um, that you know kids might have uh, about information that kids might have heard. 
Um, there are excellent public health, uh, public education resources available online, including through the Harvard Chan India Initiative website that parents can look up. Um, the uh, two other things that I would like to highlight are, um, you know, exploring with kids, not just what they're experiencing, but um, also in terms of their specific, you know, what they're missing, but also what they're worried about, um, validating those emotional feelings, um, you know, so do not say there's nothing to worry about. As parents, we, our tendency is to be protective and to reassure in ways um, to minimize those worries. Um, and I guess I would just say that, uh, you know, these are not normal times um, and anxiety or worry is a normal response within certain limits. Um, and just validating that to say that, um, you know, you understand why um, they might be worried um, can help them feel that it's a, you know, typical uh, reaction or response. Um, and in that way, focus on realistic reassurance. So, for example, um, you know, we might say to kids that our family is doing, um, you know, taking all the steps that the doctors and scientists are telling us to do, um, you know, uh, washing our hands regularly, uh, maintaining physical distancing. Um, and this is also an opportunity then to sort of focus on things that, you know, we can control. So right now, when so many things feel out of control, um, that can be pretty anxiety provoking. Um, and the uncertainty, especially the long term uncertainty can be worrisome. Um, but thinking about things that, um, you know, kids and adults can focus on. So this could include physical um, distancing and hand hygiene, um, but also finding other ways to, uh, you know, manage your own routine at home can be helpful. Thank you. As uh, Dr. Nasu mentioned, providing realistic assurances and focusing on things you can control, uh, especially hand hygiene and physical distancing can really go a long way in terms of health education as well. Coming to the uh, Indian context, Dr. Shashadri, you bring in an extensive field experience in addressing concerns related to mental health and trauma among children. As far as the corona pandemic is concerned, can you, for the audience, really elaborate and break down the major mental health challenges that children are currently facing uh, in the in the Indian population? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alasti. First, I to assure you that all the people who are listening to this program are all safe and protected. Let me break this uh, simply and succinctly into, into four or five parts. There are children who have pre-existing developmental and mental health issues. Children with intellectual disability and autism, children with anxiety, children with attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And what does the pandemic and the lockdown do to children who have pre-existing conditions? Children with intellectual disability and autism, you know, the kind of lack of stimulation that lockdown and constriction and mobility restriction uh, may cause what it does to their condition or children who have attention deficit and hyperactivity who need spaces for their exuberance to manifest. What does constriction do to it? So this is one issue. Children who have new onset mental health issues, particularly anxiety. Um, on 20th, I'm going to be doing another seminar in another forum, which is on the intolerance to uncertainty. Mm. It's a concept that is very prevalent as far as generalized anxiety is concerned and also an obsessive compulsive disorder. And how do children really process what is happening around them uh, in, in terms of the reality of the pandemic, which is very new? Uh, as Dr. Cohen pointed out, and, and Dr. Basu also reiterated, uh, this is uh, an experience, the nature of which we have we are seeing for the first time in, in our lives that we've heard of it in terms of the you know the Spanish influenza and so on. The third point uh, I want to make is special populations, children with special needs, children in institutions, children of the migrant population. And what is the predicament of these kind of children in terms of the psychosocial impact and the mental health impact? That putting it all together, what is the reality that we have seen as reported to us 
through the kind of services that we offer. And there is loss of routine, loss of educational opportunities, loss of predictability, loss of control, loss of play, loss of peer interaction, and loss of social spaces. And what does what do these losses do to the psyche of the children? And therefore, at a time like this, particularly when there is a lockdown and, and there is a partial exit from the lockdown, we are in you know 4.0 and we'll soon come to five there. If children cannot go out into social spaces, cannot go out into the world, how do you bring the world into the family? And how do you bring the world into the institutions that children occupy and inhabit? And finally, our concern has been about those children who live in families where there was already the existing theme of parental discord and domestic violence. There was already the theme of uh, abuse within the family and the exacerbation of uh, these experiences during the time of the lockdown. And we are particularly concerned about this as an issue and the kind of trauma that this might actually give rise to for a particular group of children. So this is the kind of stuff that we are really preoccupied and, and dealing with. Over to you, Dr. Right. As you, um, you know, it's interesting, my next question was, uh, in fact, related to the whole idea of, uh, you know, Dr. Karasin has worked in this area of how, uh, you know, one of the biggest protective factors after a disaster or a trauma is actually the social support and the social connection that you can provide to the communities. Uh, but as Dr. Shishadri just mentioned, um, what happens when we have loss of these social spaces and what does it do to the psyche of children? So, Dr. Coyden, what do you think about this? Um, considering we are in a unique situation uh, wherein uh, you know we have to literally bring the world inside uh, our homes and our families, um, how do you think that this situation places extra challenges on the mental health of our communities and then how do they cope with it? Thank you, that's a great question. Um, um, and one I've been thinking about a lot because it's true and in, in, in disasters, one of the, the main things that protects communities against mental health, negative mental health consequences is social support, social connection. And I remember when I lived in New York after the September 11th terrorist attacks, my own personal experience is pretty much every night after that happened, we went to dinner at different people's houses, talking about what happened, processing. And it just struck me how different this experience is where you can't, um, depending on where you live, you can't, some places you can't even go outside or you can only go outside, but you have to stay distant, my neighborhood, et cetera. Um, don't really you know, talk to my neighbor through their masks or whatever. Um, so I think it, it does have extra challenges. I think on the um, positive side, people really have stepped up to try to meet these challenges um, in terms of, thinking about how to use technology like this actually to bring people in, bring the world into people's homes to answer people's concerns. Um, Dr. Basu mentioned, and act, actually before we got on air, Dr. Shashadri was talking about all the resources online um, that are, are available to parents, teachers, et cetera, to share with families and kids in terms of mental health or how to support your kids. I've seen, I've seen, um, Colleagues in Italy have sent me things, you know, so even globally, there's a lot of sharing. So I think that in terms of resources and dissemination, there's a lot out there we can bring in. Um, the places I have um, concerns about are, which I, I know are an issue, I'm, I'm more familiar in Massachusetts where I live, but I'm, I'm certain in some of the communities Dr. Shashadri was talking about is the digital divide, families that don't have access so it's one thing providing this access to families that have technology or have access Think how do we reach families who don't have that? Um, and how do we make sure the information is getting to them? Um, and um, and that's, that's one challenge because I think for those of us with technology, we can you know, make an effort to connect with, for example, grandparents on the phone or on video chat, um, you know, having, having dinners or birthday parties online, et cetera. But what, what do people do who don't have those kind of opportunities? Um, and then the last piece I just wanted to mention about community is um, 
Dr. Shashadri talked about this uh, families where there's violence or uh, parental discord. And I actually just heard a report in Boston today on when I was listening to the news this morning that um, calls into social services, family protective services have gone down, but there's a lot of concern that it's because um, teachers in the US, it's teachers um, and daycare workers who often make the calls to social services. So um, one thing that I've um, been made aware of is that to get the information out to families that the services that were there are still there and um, hotlines, et cetera. And so maybe, you know, maybe some of the other speakers, maybe Dr. Shadri can talk about that, but that the, the crisis lines are still there. Um, and we need to acknowledge while we're in sort of lockdown, we need to acknowledge that the home is not a safe place for everyone and that for some families need to know that there are places they can reach out to or call even under the circumstance. Thank you for bringing that up um, because, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Shishadri, how would you like to respond to this? I mean, talking about social services in India, where yeah. obviously there is, uh, there is a substantive uh, digital divide, which is obviously uh, plugging over the decades. Uh, but considering we are looking at reaching families who do not have access to technology, uh, from that uh, sense and from a public health perspective, um, could you outline or could you describe to the use, uh, to the viewers what has been the India's systemic response to addressing the psychosocial needs of children? And for example, for an average Indian who's watching this webinar, what are the various services or helpline that he or she should be aware of? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Avasti, for that. Sanshipri, I have said that the children are the same as the children who 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 are the same as और इस इन सब के जीवन में जो दिनचर्या इनका खो गया है शिक्षा की ऑपर्चुनिटीज जो खो गई है खेल और मित्रता जो खो गई है तो कैसे इसको लेके हम इनके लिए सुविधाएं अभी उपलब्ध करें वेद सिस्टमिक रिस्पांस इज कंसर्न लेट मी स्टार्ट विद द सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑर्डर दैट वाज पास on a Suomoto uh, writ petition on 3rd of April by a quorum consisting of Justice Nageshwar Rao and uh, Justice uh, Deepa Gupta. The Supreme Court order has the largest section on mental health and well-being of children. It, it has 11 major points. Acknowledge the stress and anxiety of children that it's a normal response to an abnormal situation. That And, and look at how interesting the Supreme Court order is. It creates, it makes a nuanced uh, uh, recommendation on, on mental health. It says different children respond differently to the same emotional stress. Some people respond to anxiety with withdrawal and silence, and some people with aggression and anger. And it says recognize that. We assure children that they are safe, share, and validate the point that Dr. Basu made, the importance of validation. Talk to children, encourage them to connect to each other, avoid too much of reading on all the stuff that is happening in the media and divert their attention to other experiences. Reinstate routine, spend time with them in relaxation and enjoyable activities. Consider the possibility of violence, encourage peer support, work with the staff so that they are capacitated to deal with children who have pre-existing problems and new problems, address stigma, engage children in health-related and physical exercises, and work with social systems, particularly those who provide online resources, people who work with children with special needs, and, and so on. This was the Supreme Court order of 3rd April. The Uch Diyale ne 3 April ko hi kuch dishai di thi both the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and the Ministry of Women and Child Development have issued their own advisory, which have been disseminated through all possible routes so that they are available to child care service providers and to civil society. Childline, 
India Foundation, which is a toll-free number, 1098098, -098, under the Ministry of Child Women and Child uh, Development. It's partner agencies, it's frontline workers all over. The Ministry ha has already held several orientation and training webinars for staff of institutions, for Child Welfare Committee members, for the Integrated Child Protection Scheme functionaries, for childline partners, for childline frontline workers, to look at mental health, safety protection issues. And all this has been disseminated, and this is an ongoing exercise. Institutions of the nature that I work with in the ministry has been designated as the nodal agency to look at mental health all across the country as far as COVID is concerned. There is a cloud-based interactive voice response system, an IDRS system, where there is a helpline 080-4611-0007. Shunya Art Shunya, Char Che Ek Ek Shunya 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 Saath. Depending on the telecom zone that the call comes from, the call goes to that particular state. And then you have a voice activated thing. For example, if it comes from Pashim Bengal, it will just say English, English, Hindi or Bengali. And you press on that, then it says, is it a child related problem? Is it an old age problem? Is it a woman with domestic violence issue? Mm. Or is it any adult mental health issue? And then it goes to that zone to a trained government professional who takes the call. And so that's the kind of stuff that has gone on. Both the ministries, in terms of the expansion in telepsychiatry and telecommunication, follow the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, and the Interagency Standing Committee of the advisories of the same nature that uh, universities and agencies like Harvard have, have put out, you know, which follow some of the internationally accepted advisories. So this is the kind of framework. There is a Supreme Court order. There are ministry advisories and ministry websites that are in public domain. But the ministry also suggests that all the agencies that work on the field, particularly agencies like Childline and other supporting INGOs like UNICEF, which are supporting this, really create a structure so that this help really percolates down to the most vulnerable people and is not dependent on high tech uh, yeah, resources and high tech networks because 1098 is a toll free number. Yeah, the number that I mentioned is a toll free number, and anyone who has a mobile phone uh, or can access a mobile phone can basically call and access these services. Over to you, Ananya. Okay. Yeah, she's <laughs> ah, she's back. Okay. As we were talking about this, you know, before we were going on for this webinar, I imagined internet stress, which is another challenge that we're all facing uh, together. Um, uh, Dr. Shishadri, would you like to just um, spell out the helpline number that you just mentioned again for our viewers in case they haven't noted it down? The child line number is 10981098. The government of India. IVRS cloud-based number is 080. Though it's the Bangalore code, it is cloud-based, so it's all over India. 080-4611-0007. Shunya Art Shunya, Char Che Ek Ek, Shunya 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 Saad. Ye samuche Bharat mein aap kahi se bhi phone kare, voice activated hai, to bhasha anusar, आपके प्रांत में आपके आपके क्षेत्र में जो भी विशेषज्ञ है वो आपकी मदद के लिए तैयार है थैंक यू डॉक्टर बासु आई वाज रीडिंग अप योर रिसर्च एंड यू समवे कोटेड दैट सपोर्टिंग योर चिल्ड्रन स्टार्ट्स विद सपोर्टिंग योरसेल्फ दिस स्टेटमेंट साउंड्स अ बिट पैराडॉक्सिकल बट कुड यू फर्दर इलैबोरेट ऑन द सेम एंड आल्सो शेयर सम स्किल्स एंड स्ट्रेटजीज फॉर प्रमोटिंग Uh, not just the well-being of children, uh, which is of course the case, but also the well-being of parents. This started. Yeah, I, I, it's an old age adage. I, I really can't take credit for it, but um, you know, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, what affects 
one family member affects, you know, the other family members as well. And, uh, you know, as parents or are really in any consistent, any adults who are in consistent caregiving roles, we tend to focus, you know, first on our kids, um, especially right now. Um, a lot of, you know, I'm hearing a lot from parents about kind of the challenges of, um, you know, in working from home while also helping their kids with schoolwork. Um, many people may also be caring for elderly aging parents themselves. Um, so, you know, there are household demands, um, things we need to do for our kids, um, job responsibilities or stress associated with transitions or job loss. Um, right now, the demands on parents is really tremendous. And um, it's also in general typical for us to focus on our kids and family members and uh, prioritizing our own kind of well-being um, and health. It sometimes takes a back burner. Um, and, you know, recognizing first and foremost that our own emotional reserves are not the same. And so being very intentional and deliberate about um, kind of emotionally refueling ourselves or refreshing ourselves regularly um, is really key because of several reasons. And first and foremost, um, parents are, you know, typically the most important source of support. And that's particularly true now um, when kids may not have access to other support systems, whether it's through school or extended family or grandparents. Um, but also, you know, kids learn to sort of respond to transitions and stressors based on what they experience and observe um, from their parents. So in some ways, when we um, support ourselves, we not only refuel ourselves to better support the people who depend on us, um, but it, those are valuable learning and teaching opportunities for children as well. Um, one sort of last thing that I will mention is that, you know, self-care also includes self-compassion. So, of course, there's physical self-care and, you know, whether that's taking a walk or um, if you, you know, and I recognize also that physical distancing is a privilege. Um, not everyone has access to open spaces. That's not always easy to do. Um, and certainly concerns about potential exposure um, and following sort of the lockdown um, orders entails that people stay at home. Um, but, you know, certainly doing yoga, and, and I know we'll talk more about that. There are many opportunities to engage in activities at home, uh, but building in frequent breaks through the day can be helpful. Um, so, but besides physical care and sleep and nutrition, all of which are very basic things that can help, um, you know, support our, you know, functioning. Um, I would also highlight sort of self-compassion. As parents, we are pretty hard on ourselves. Um, we expect a lot uh, from ourselves. Um, but part of this change and adapting to this change means readjusting our expectations, not just of our kids in terms of what they're doing for school, but also of ourselves. Um, if there are ways in which we can intentionally and mindfully um, you know, refocus kind of our attention to our own care and divert some of that worry in a sort of a compassionate way towards ourselves. Um, those are all valuable ways in which parents can support themselves and therefore the people who depend on them. Yes, as you already mentioned, then let's let us talk about yoga and mindfulness. Uh, my next question to Dr. Karistin, um, as Dr. Basu just mentioned, uh, mindfulness and breathing exercises, some of which, in fact, have been uh, you know practiced uh, traditionally in India uh, for ages, uh, is recently and increasingly being recognized by the scientific community as bedrocks for improved mental health and well-being of the communities. What implications do you think this emerging field of research has on promoting well-being amongst communities um, as far as the COVID outbreak is concerned? And do you think that this crisis, when we are sort of um, being forced to stay at homes, do you think this is an opportunity to also start looking inside? Uh, thank you. It's, it's, uh, this is nice. It's something nice to sort of think about coming out of the pandemic is I think one of the one of the potential silver linings is this focus on mental health and wellness. I mean, we talk a lot about you know the increased anxiety, which is really important, but also, People are, as they appreciate, this is maybe a longer term thing in terms of a lockdown and transition, hopefully to the quote unquote new normal that um, 
we need to find ways, we all need to find ways to sort of manage our stress and also kind of sit with ourselves or um, with our families. We don't have as many distractions uh, that we as we normally do. And so I do think the science of mindfulness um, has a lot to contribute here. And as you said, this is something that I don't know how many hundreds, thousands of years um, people have known in India. So we know from science um, that the meditation and uh, mindfulness meditation changes the changes the brain, makes people feel better um, in terms of reduces anxiety. It's had in terms of there's mindfulness based practices that prevent depression relapse and as well as has longer term effects, positive effects on physical health. So I think sort of science is discovering what um, people have known for thousands of years, which is which is nice when the two things come together. And um, in, in the US, we're seeing the sort of increased popularization of this in terms of online resources uh, for, you know, to practice mindfulness, whether it's through apps or through um, people making courses freely available. Um, but what I guess I would hope is that um, folks, that this might be a chance for folks who have used these practices in their past or learned them um, growing up to maybe revisit them. And maybe it's a chance while people are at home to sort of revisit them with their kids. If, if, if their kids don't don't um, know this and use this as an opportunity to kind of um, revisit these practices. And, um, you know, as uh, Dr. Basu was mentioning, it's really hard. There's a lot of pressure, especially on parents right now in terms of what, you know, all the things we're expected to do if you're working or not working or, you know, your kids are at home and you've got to, you're worried about your, um, you're worried about your uh, job, et cetera. There's just, a, I don't want to put more pressure on parents. I'm very cautious about that. But simple things like with my own meditation practice, uh, one of the things I learned was my teacher, the teacher uh, suggested you start with a couple minutes a day, like even two or three minutes, which seemed completely that seemed doable. Even five minutes seemed too long for me at the earlier. And then once you sort of start with two minutes, you, that seems short, you can expand it. So that's very, you can start very simply and practically from a, um, uh, you know, in some, some way that's very sort of easy and uh, then expand it from there. And so I do think that in terms of, um, individual well being and, and then even within families, this is, sort of an opportunity to revisit things that people probably, you know, already have in their toolbox um, in terms of how to cope with stress and anxiety. And something that Dr. Basu always reminds me is that, and to say is that everyone has been through difficult time before. Every time, every person who's listening to this broadcast has been through something difficult in their life. Now, this is a unique situation. I don't want to minimize that. But one of the things we usually ask people to do is to think back to other difficult times and what helped you then were there certain practices or skills that helped you in the past and they would be things to bring back now that's not to say this isn't different and not to minimize it but anyone who's human has been through adversity and we all have skills to get through it um, sometimes we just have to be reminded that we we have overcome things before right thank you as um I just read in a tweet, mindfulness or practicing meditation is not tough. It's just important to practice it regularly or remember to practice it regularly. Um, my next question is to you, uh, Dr. Basu. Um, we are all using social media. And so let's talk about children and, and the impact that social media is having on them. So as you know, children are using a lot of social media. They have online access. And they're likely to hear a lot of information, some of which may not be accurate. Moreover, exposure to media, including television use, can be quite um, anxiety provoking. Um, in this context, as parents, uh, what would be your advice on how to encourage our children to put some sort of healthy limits to screen time or use of social media? Yeah. Um I think this is definitely, you know, parenting in the in this digital age, uh, you know, certainly has its advantages um, right now with so many solutions to coping involving technological or online resources. Um, 
but also comes with uh, a range of challenges. And, um, and this can, again, look very different um, for children across different ages. Um, so with younger kids, um, well, so let me just back up to say, uh, Across the board, um, parents are, you know, talking about increased screen time. And, and even outside the pandemic, this is a uh, concern, you know, how much screen time is too much. And with all of us being at home um, and limited access to maybe childcare, um, the amount of screen time has certainly gone up. And I think this is, uh, you know, to be expected. And so one thing um, is, you know, certainly there needs to be some routines and some limits. Um, but the key thing to focus on is the quality of the programming. Um, so that's number one, I would say. The second thing I would say is that um, young kids can, uh, for generally speaking, pediatricians recommend that for young kids, so certainly preschoolers and younger, to avoid um, any adult content. Um, there are multiple child-friendly um programming um, available, and we can certainly provide links and resources to that, where kids can learn um, in a sort of more age appropriate manner about germs um, and about kind of hand washing. And again, things that they can control, which are sort of age appropriate, healthy ways of learning about what they're experiencing right now. Um, with kids younger than kindergarten, certainly under the age of two, um, generally it's recommended um, that no screen time with primarily video chatting as a way of social connection and maintaining uh, connections with families can be helpful. Um, another thing that I would say is that you know, screen time doesn't have to be alone time. Um, in fact, the best way is to either watch it with your kids um, or, you know, it, to sort of ask them and talk to them about it afterwards. Um, that's a way of actively engaging with the content that the kids are exposed to. Um, with older um, children, the you know, teens and youth, um, taking a more collaborative approach, um, you know, inviting them to watch the news with you, um, that can be helpful to, again, as we talked about earlier, know about um, what types of uh, resources and uh, news sources they're exposed to and making sure that those are credible. Um, another key thing is, uh, you know, designating media free times and media free zones in the household can be helpful. So ways of setting some limits around it. Um, the other thing is parents um, can model healthy boundaries themselves. So, um, you know, when parents model that there are times in the day that they don't watch the news or they're not on their phones, um, such as meal times or other times when there's more active engagement um, with the family, um, those are ways in which, um, you know, children experience that there are um, healthy boundaries to kind of media exposure. Um, two other quick things I will say is um, something Dr. Shashadri mentioned was, you know, uh, every child's kind of temperament and personality and, um, you know, any existing mental health challenges that they might have gone through is sort of unique to them. And, you know, my philosophy in working with families is that um, I think parents are experts on their kids and that they know their kids well. They understand their temperament. Um, so even within the same family, the same amount of information or the same type of information, um, kids can react differently to it. So if you have an anxious kid, you may, uh, you know, set limits around media use and talk to them about it um, ahead of time um, in ways that might be different than someone, say, who is less worried or anxious. Um, you know, you might have a budding scientist in your family and there might be healthy ways in which you can preserve some of your kids' curiosity um, by, you know, relying on resources and online sources that um, promote a healthy engagement and curiosity about, say, the virus or the treatments for it. Um, the last thing is the impact on sleep. Um, so certainly developing a, you know, sleep is something that is just, it has a system-wide impact, like it affects our mood, it affects our physical functioning, how we think. Um, if there was one of the main things to sort of try and maintain a healthy routine around or is around sleep. And one of the common things that parents complain about is the increased screen time, especially leading up to bedtime. Um, recognizing that it's a way for teens, especially um, to connect with their friends. So there's some positive social 
uh, you know, piece to it. Um, but just making sure that there is a lead up to the bedtime and to sleep that can, uh, you know, there's no screen time, um, at least an hour before bed um, can be really, really helpful. Um, my next question is sort of a related question to the use of social media. Um, in fact, the positive use of social media as far as schools are concerned, as all the viewers in India know, since the lockdown, children have been out of schools and most of the education has moved online. In that context, Dr. Koenen, um, as you know and understand, online education or e-learning seems to be becoming the new norm. Um, but some parents have sort of expressed their concerns regarding the fact that their ch children are not getting the real education uh, because of increased screen time, and they worry if it could, uh, you know, promote more sedentary behavior. How would you respond to this concern? And is there a scientific association? I mean, what is the scientific association between use of digital technology and well-being of children or adolescents? <laughs> wow, that's a big question. Um, I guess I, I'll have a I'll have a couple of things to say about this, but I'd also like uh, Dr. Shashadri and Bastu maybe to weigh in, and um, because uh, Dr. Shashadri in the earlier in this broadcast made the point that there's these there's different groups of children, how this would affect differently, and so it's hard to generalize. Um, so I'll make some in terms of general points is one, um, I'm, when I'm, a, I'm a parent, my son's 13. And so I have these same anxieties that other parents are having. And uh, his, he's in a public school in the US as a government you know, school. Um, and um, you know, he's, he's certainly not getting the same education. His teachers are really trying, but uh, they have a lot of kids and um, I'm working all day. I'm on my Zoom call, so I'm not educating him. Like he's, I'm relying on them and it's maybe a couple hours a day versus six hours a day. So some of this is advice, things I tell myself. Um, so one is this, is this is lasting a while, but this is a temporary situation. And I do believe, and I, my esteemed colleagues, I would like them to correct me if they feel like I'm wrong in this. I do believe that for the sort of more average child and the more average house, you know, household, so not a, particularly special needs child um, with a lot of disabilities or a um, child in a you know really adverse situation, they will be resilient and will sort of, this won't have a, a long-term impact on their development. It's all, the one thing I remind myself as a parent is that it's not just my son who's sort of missing this time in school. It's really all children globally. It's not even just in my town. It's it's you know so and that just that's to minimize it, but it is um, something that um, they all will be experienced. They all will miss this time, and for most kids in most circumstances, most average circumstances, they will be able to catch up either through um, things their parents do or the schools will have to address this. And um, we even see this at Harvard. Our students. Our students are complaining they're not, they're, they paid for a very expensive education and they're not getting what they, um, feeling like they're not getting everything they wanted. And on their transcripts, it will say that this was a particular time. This will sort of, so they won't be judged in the same way. The students are very anxious about that. So that's one thing is to, it goes to what Dr. Basu said about managing expectations. Um, and then the second thing is in terms of it definitely, I think the sedentary behavior we're all, we're all more sedentary. I didn't realize how much I walked during the day until I <laughs> until I stayed home all the time. So um, I think the things we can do as parents is try to balance the time on the screen and time, whether it's Zoom online education with whether it's, um, and this is about changing expectations. So, so for I have a puppy and a 13 year old son, and now I allow them to run around the house and jump on the furniture, which is something I never would have allowed before. <laughs> but in the beginning of this, my son set up an obstacle course in my apartment, which is a small apartment. It's, a, it's you know, it's an apartment, it's not a house, but they, um, you know, so sort of trying to figure out ways of, of moving around, even if it's in the house. And now that the weather's nice and we're allowed to go outside, going outside, um, even though we have to stay distant, can't do a lot. He can't play soccer with his friends, but can we go for walks and um, those kinds of things. So trying to balance out the sedentary behavior and also to realize that, you know, just like 
I'm drained. If I'm on I'm on Zoom calls or you know Skype calls all day. So he will be too if he's on um, class online over and over again. And so trying to what I've tried to do as a parent is decide with him, like what is the most important things in terms of school? So he has his main classes, he has like everyone's, you know, he has his art class, music class, everything's trying to do something online. What are our priorities for the week in line with what the school is asking for and what does he need to do and what can, what am I willing to let go? So really as a parent, knowing your kid, knowing what's important to you and your family and emphasizing that, doing everything that you normally do and having all the expectations um, and even if you have them available online, it's not gonna probably work right now, or at least I can say it's not totally working for me to really managing expectations. Um, but maybe Dr. Shashadri or Boss, you wanna talk about kids who are in more special needs, or I, I, I would imagine they have something to add to this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, let's, let's uh, really um, turn to your know, children who do not have access to social media. I mean, children, we are talking about children who do not, who are not worried about excessive screen time on uh, digital learning platforms. So Dr. Tishadri, uh, you know, we are talking about children of migrant workers and their families who are not just facing a physical threat, but are also dealing with loss of daily wages and food insecurity and so on and so forth. How do you anticipate the impact of the current crisis on their mental health and well-being, and how is that so different from what we are talking about, from what we were talking about right now? Uh, before I respond to that, uh, Dr. Avasti, I'd like to make some connections with what Dr. Basu and Dr. Koenen have said. Or my Facebook pe bhi dekh raha hu ki kaafi comments aa rahe hain, aur is prashn ke liye se sambandhit meri pratikriya hai, main jodna chahta hu. Let me quickly read something for you. The kids of this is something I wrote in response. The kids of today are digital natives. We are we adults are digital immigrants. Online and web learning is going to be the new normal, the cliche, the new mode. Especially in unusual and unprecedented realities like the pandemic lockdown. Now there are two areas of concern: the impact of screen time on the developing brain. Ek ye hai. कि छोटे छोटे बच्चों में या जिनमें जो दिव्यांग है बहुत ज्यादा स्क्रीन टाइम हो तो क्या उनके विकास में कुछ अड़चने आएंगी द अदर इज एन एस्टैब्लिश ग्रुप ऑफ बिहेवियरल एडिक्शंस दिस मोबाइल यूज गेमिंग सोशल मीडिया इंटरनेट यूज टेक्स्टिंग सेक्सटिंग पोर्नोग्राफी एटसेट्रा तो ये आदत जो है खास करके किशोर अवस्था में क्या ज्यादा वो इस दिशा में जाएंगे नाउ वन मस्ट नॉट फॉरगेट that even without the covid and lockdown and online um, uh, learning online learning was already part of uh, many initiatives that had been started then. now the challenge is really to balance these tensions and understand that many realities cannot be wished away for the present ek parivar mein it's about a democratic agreement on routine between families and children ek saman adhikari nirnay pe hum pahunche about judicious screen time dincharya kaise hoga maintaining academic learning keeping family rituals alive experiencing other sources of engagement such as art music movement and subverting the mobility constraint by using the web to actually keep family and social relationships vibrant to ek to ye cheez hai baaki facebook mein ye dekh raha hu ki kaafi prashn aaye hain aur kuch vyaktigat prashn hain you know particularly with families that are going through difficult jahan mata pita ke beech mein anban hai aur ncpcr ki pratikriya kya hai iske i see that there are many questions like this now i want to address couple of them ek to jahan tak ki divyang bacche jo hai aur jin bachcho ke sath challenging behaviors hai especially children and children challenging behaviors uh, i see that dr avasti has already put uh, on the facebook some resources for learning i'd also like to add the kind of resources that we have for individual what parents can do individually with children 
these are not proof strategies on the website that you know we have as part of our community work www.nimhanschildproject.in www.nimhans n i m h a n s child c h i l d project.in or is me ab interventions mein jaye if you navigate the site there are workbooks there are flip charts which you can use at your home easily with children but coming to a very important point here which people have made how do you bring the world in to marginalized and vulnerable populations and this is where the remarkable work of rudolf steiner anthroposophy ki isme teen cheeze hain bhai aur behno kriya prakriya pratikriya kriya matlab yog the doing prakriya process pratikriya responsibility iteration and interactivity all you need to do with special needs children to bring nature back into the home is a chhota sa gamla lijiye usme ret hai ya mitti hai just put in couple of mustard or coriander seeds at these kids look after it it germinates and and in in, in, in two or three days and for these children to see that they can nurture a plant so these kind of anthroposophic techniques where the five domains of child development physical speech and language social emotional and cognitive how through this kind of work and the evocative use of anthroposophic techniques of nature of engagement with nature of art of movement and so on really brings in the world into uh, the home and therefore even the children who have challenging behaviors children with intellectual disability the young bachche hain lekin zid hai ya gussa hai ya saman ko todte wagaira hai how you can engage them in in manners which are calming and which is why the whole issue of meditation and mindfulness of children is through issues of imagery you know you, you may not go up, be able to go out but you can close your eyes and for a moment imagine ki samudra ke tat pe hai i can hear the sea and then the sound of the sea i put my hand on this feet on the sand and then i'm moving towards the water oh that cold water how does it feel that so this kind of imagery work also helps you know children develop a sense of calm in a situation where there is the lockdown and and so on coming back to the specific point that dr avasti raised which is uh, really you know for children who are marginalized and in vulnerable situations you know, the, the migrant children children who do not have access uh, to technology and so on and this is indeed going to be the challenge of covid going forward many people have asked the question uh, uh, on on the facebook chat that uh, will there be a health impact you know on children and and the health statistics show surprisingly that though you know there is a there are recent recent lancet uh, articles that have looked at a, a modeling uh, paradigm to really look at what the covid health impact will be on children but a, as you can see it has impacted adults and old people much more than children the impact ladies and gentlemen will be more psychosocial it will be on the economic impact and what it does to daily wages families and migrant families who have suffered loss of income and the concern that we have is about child trafficking child labor child marriage and therefore this is the time really for social systems though you know agencies spoke about deinstitutionalization but given these dangers we really need to examine for the integrated child protection scheme women and child departments the child welfare committee to really look at vulnerable children and empower institutions to really see that these children are safe temporarily till their parents find gainful employment and income generation and then these children can go back to their families so we must not trash institutions at this point of time because this is the time that we really need to address how the most vulnerable populations the migrant populations who have not been able to reach their homes and who have suffered loss of income and loss of wages 
uh, and how do we empower them so that the secondary impact on children jo arthik parinam hone wala hai aur usse judi hui bachchon pe jo parinam aur prabhav hoga usko hum kis tarike se sambhale taki sansthaon jo hai temporarily hum bachchon ko rakhe jab tak families taiyar hai aur fir bacche wapas aa sakte hain over to you ananya right thank you um in fact another related question on the facebook comment has been and which is possibly very contextual uh, to india is that uh, what do you tell a parent who is sitting in a village maybe illiterate um, in the sense of formal education and what do you tell them uh, they also have children who are going to schools and they understand and realize that the acad- the academic year of 2020 is going to be affected what do you really tell such parents and what do they tell their children and what could be some mechanisms and strategies to reach out to them dr basu do you would you like to um, share some of your insights on the same i mean i think dr shashadri and dr konan sort of referred to this throughout especially in response to the last question is that the impact of the pandemic is you know some people have called the virus an equalizer and others have said it's an illuminator and and i think the latter is more true is that um you know it's this pandemic doesn't impact um everyone and families equally um there's a disproportionate burden on um under resourced communities and um you know i think while the screen time issues may not apply and those are completely different challenges um as dr shashadri said that um i think the economic impact and then its subsequent impact on mental health is a looming issue and in fact there is uh you know a population based research uh, globally in multiple contexts including here in the us where issues of disparity um are front and center uh, in our conversations and prior periods such as the 2008 recession here showed that following um this economic downturn there is increase in you know household violence both domestic violence and child maltreatment so i think uh you know some of the solutions uh well first of all the policies and solutions i'm not a policy person so this is just a personal point of view um to say that uh policy solutions have to partly account for these disparities so it's not going to be a one size fits all so that's one um the second thing i would say is that mental health interventions um will often need to be contextualized uh along with other types of economic uh, interventions such as the ones that dr shashadri mentioned um you know parents being able to support their children uh in whether it's academically in terms of nutritional needs and basic needs um entails parents being able to support themselves and their families financially um so i think some of these solutions are not just located in mental health but at multiple policy fronts right so in fact uh, dr koinen there's a question for you um you know asking for what are some of the global innovations um you know that you could suggest as far as coping with the mental health and psychosocial issues is concerned and going back to your research you studied why some people develop post traumatic stress disorder while some are resilient so can you tell us can you tell the audience and elaborate on some of the factors that really make communities more resilient which can really be universally applied across i mean um another challenging um another challenging question um so in terms of what makes people vulnerable or resilient uh there are some of the things we mentioned already um in terms of social support and interconnectedness is one of the things that helps with um individual resilience family resilience community resilience and um another thing that we've learned is and i've learned a lot about in terms of this pandemic broadly is flexibility so we often don't think of um flexibility as a strategy um but it's i think we've all had to learn to be flexible individuals families um a lot of th- in pl- um introducing a lot of the things we've talked about today in a family will require flexibility in communities and the government had to be flexible in terms of how to address the policy um policies around the pandemic um so flexibility is key interconnectedness and then i think another thing is um 
humility in terms of one of the things that I've learned um, and from this pandemic, and I hope we've all learned, is that we actually, um, none of us has the answers. So no one government has the answer, no one individual, no one family, even though we're experts, we don't have all the answers, unfortunately, I wish I did. My adolescent reminds me I don't have any of the answers every single day. <laughs> and, and so, um, and one of the positives I hope can come out of this is that we really learn from each other. So actually for me hearing what um, the government in India is doing has really enlightened me actually. And some of the things that I've heard about from Dr. Shashadri, I wish we were doing in the US. And this made me think about how could we use some similar strategies. Um, so those are some in terms of broad principles about resilience. Um, the other piece is that um, I think this has really brought out is around um, the need to um, think about mental health, not in this ghettoized way, for lack of a better word, as sort of it's like this 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 problem sort of out there. Um, or this problem we we bring up when there's a crisis, but in but mental health and well-being are fundamental to not just health broadly, but fundamental to a functioning economy and society. And um, although you know all of us are um, can be considered specialists in mental health, um, I think we all recognize that we need to move on thinking of mental health as specialty care and think of it in much more a public health way, which it sounds like in India has been done for a while from some of the things we were talking about before, but um, how can it be integrated? How can health and well-being be integrated in the fabric of our lives, whether it's in terms of policy, in terms of our schools and systems that our children interact with, in terms of our families? And um, is there an opportunity here to think about, to revisit mental health as fundamental to health broadly? And how would that, um, how could that be part of the new normal? And I don't have all the answers to that, but it is something that continues to strike me that even in healthcare, healthcare in the US, we treat the brain as if it's separate from the rest of the body. If something's in your head, you go to the psychiatrist or something, you know. But in terms of at least my, my limited um, novice understanding of sort of Ayurvedic medicine, which is tradition in India, um, these things have not been thought of as separate. So maybe there is an opportunity there to, um, really approach health and well-being and society in a more integrated way. Thank you. So as a closing question, and you know, really talking about COVID-19 response as a model respond, response, uh, Dr. Shashadri, um, how do you um, sort of respond to the irony that diseases, infectious diseases like tuberculosis or malnutrition, which sort of kill more people in India each day, then the mortality resulting from COVID-19 put together has not re received the same attention or urgency as the current outbreak. And that's not just in India, but worldwide. And do you think that the global community should use the current response as a model response to fight against other important public health emergencies? Right. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Neha Sade, by the way, it's anthroposophy. Rudolf Steiner, uh, with the Waldorf system of education, communes for adults with intellectual disability called Camp Hill, the anthroposophic practice of medicine, uh, but a lot of work with individuals with special needs. So Divyang Logokili, anthroposophy, S-O-P-H-Y. Coming back uh, to Dr. Avasti's question, which is, uh, it's a very important question. Uh, the total number of people who died in India is 2,000 plus, uh, maybe 10, 20 times that number of children die every day from malnutrition, tuberculosis and diarrheal diseases. So where uh, are we reconciling uh, in our minds uh, this from a public health uh, perspective? Um, now, I want to answer this looking at what COVID uh, pandemic and the lockdown has taught us about streamlining our services at the primary, secondary and the tertiary level there. Now, many of us personally believe that there are emerging emergencies that are going uh, to happen going forward. 
and our response and support system to this have to be in place. And as has already been pointed out, uh, the economic ramifications and, and the psychosocial fallout of these ramifications uh, are very difficult to predict uh, right now the world over then. Now the planning commission, which is now known uh, as the Niti Ayog, already recognizes the importance of psychosocial support uh, in the way that it has constructed uh, its, its response. Therefore, Dr. Avasti, I look at the current reality as an opportunity for a unified response mechanism to build alliances on the ground for a standardized and quality assured action. Because this is going to pave the way for how health systems and systems of governance will respond going forward. Now, we must understand that many of the national health programs are vertical programs. And health, the, the, not national programs and national programs, but state is, health is a state subject. But what the COVID has done that is that it has provided us opportunities to work across departments for multiple stakeholders. So it's not just the health department, it's also the women and child department. Interestingly, the other day, uh, we had a very nice webinar organized by the National Police Academy in Hyderabad in collaboration with UNICEF. And the Police Academy is already thinking of setting up a dedicated center for child protection. So this kind of synergy is what the COVID pandemic has, not that we didn't know it, but it has sharply delineated for us the need for this kind of synergy and cross-domain interactions, which we already knew, but it was working in fits and starts and in, in pockets. But this unified response system has really been brought sharply to light by the COVID pandemic then. And therefore, here is an opportunity for us to work together, both at a systemic level, but also for what a unified response means for that one family in their vulnerable situation, dealing with their reality and predicament, and how these systems therefore respond to that one family and how that one family responds because of frontline workers providing for them what a unified response within that family is, maybe for a special child and maybe for the special needs that that child has. So it works both at a micro level, at a meso level, and at, at a macro level. And that's the kind of opportunity that this reality has really provided for us. Over to you, Dr. Avasti. Thank you so much. I think that's an amazing uh, closing note to think about a uniform, unified response at the systemic level, at the meso level, and then uh, back at the family level and down to the last child standing. Um, so, And of course, COVID-19 is an opportunity to reinvent your own minds and bodies and your relationships, your interaction with the environment. With that, we would like to close this discussion uh, and thank the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights and Chairperson Sir for uh, giving us this opportunity to bring and convene such an amazing panel. Um, Harvard India Center would also be coming up with the second round of our webinar series this Friday with Dr. Barry Bloom talking about vaccines, treatment, and managing the pandemic on May 15, 6.30 p.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time. And the link is in the comment section uh, below. So thank you so much. Please stay safe, uh, stay at home, um, and have the, a good uh, rest of the lockdown. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.